on uh, on abductions, we we mentioned uh, that uh, in this last year, the period of reporting, we actually highlighted that there were three cases reported on uh, Mombasa Road, uh, which are the Pakistani nationals and a Kenyan driver. We also reported the case of the South Sudanese Maurice Mabior. Uh, uh, who was uh, abducted from Kangunda Road by people in police uniform. And we also highlighted the case of Osman Halif, uh, who was an aide to the Nairobi County Governor. Uh, we also just mentioned in passing uh, to, to stress how, uh, how, how the, the, the abductions continue to proceed unabated and more brazenly, the recent case of uh, Ras Ja, Rai, someone Rai, just want to sing Rai, so we re highlighted those. But on extrajudicial killings, uh, we reported quite a number of cases that have come to our attention. Uh, we said that during the period June to January 2022 to June 2023, we recorded 22 cases of extrajudicial killings and nine cases of enforced disappearance allegedly caused by security agencies. Majority of the victims were youth uh, aged between 18 to 35. In September last year, 39 bodies were discovered in River Yala and the Aberdeer Forest. In the month of March 2023, we undertook a fact-finding mission uh, in the North Rift region where we went to Turkana, West Pokot, Elgeo Maraquet, and Beringo counties. Uh, because of the enhanced insecurity and uh, the uh, bandit operations that were going on there. Our media reports, we say, it captured uh, 125 deaths that occurred since June 2021 in the North Rift area uh, due to banditry. In Kerio Valley alone, at least 40 people were alleged to have been killed from January 2022 uh, to March 2023. In early March uh, 2023, seven people, including two healthcare workers, were killed in a span of four days in Maraquet East. And in March 2023, in what appeared to be coordinated attacks, Bannett killed several people in Maraquet, Baringo, and Tukana counties and drove away an unknown number of livestock. The Commission, through its monitoring and investigation exercise, recorded a total of 24 fatalities during the public protests and demonstrations held this year. And uh, during the demonstrations, which resumed on 7th July, during Sabah Sabah Day, we recorded a further loss of seven lives. And during the protest called on 12th July, we recorded at least nine people uh, killed. And uh, we also recorded a further seven deaths during the electioneering period. Now, we've been asked how will we exert pressure on the state? <laughs> On, on this matters. There are several things we do as an institution to exert pressure on the state. Uh, and uh, some of it is uh, diplomatic. We make reports and we require them to respond. Uh, but some others are collaborative efforts with agencies like IPOR to ensure investigations are carried out, concluded, and then we liaise with our partners at ODPP to ensure prosecution. Uh, where nothing happens, sometimes we as an institution may institute litigation to ensure some of this happens. So it requires collaborative effort. It requires a cross-sectoral uh, effort because even the media must collaborate with us. As of now, to be fair, none, no one has come to make a complaint to us as a commission that my camera was destroyed or my equipment was destroyed. But we have the information. But sometimes for us to take it further, for instance, to litigation, it helps when you actually come to us as a commission and we record it in our complaint system that this is a matter that has been taken up as a human rights violation so that we can support uh, other action. So we are here. Please liaise with us. We are ready to walk the journey with you and see that uh, reparations uh, take place. Um, how do I rate the country? <laughs> I think as an institution, we agreed, and I'm not going to go against what the commission agreed, that we will not give a grading. And therefore, I will not give a grading here. My report speaks for itself. There are areas where they have done well, and we highlight them and we commend it. 
but we also point out areas where there are weaknesses and we continue to monitor those. So you can see that in every area there's a little bit of traction in terms of trying, but not sufficient for turnaround. So we continue to monitor and we continue to call for change. But I will not give a grade. Thank you very much. And I'll ask you to bear with me for that. Uh, on detention, if you listen to the report, we actually spoke about the right of access to justice. Uh, we also spoke of the, the right of children uh, not to be detained. And we also spoke on the, on the bail policy and diversion policies that reduce congestion in, in prisons. We spoke about the need for amendment to the Prisons Act. So there's a lot of issues in there which tease out the issue of detentions. We probably did not just talk about it as detention, but we talked about the Prisons Act, we talked about the right of speedy justice, uh, we talked about the uh, diversion policies so that we don't have everybody staying in prison. It is really sad that the data we have is that 62% of people in prisons today are people who are not yet uh, um, uh, determined guilty. Their cases are not concluded. They are people who are in remand. And that is very, very sad because the prisons should be for those who have been convicted and found guilty. Our prisons, on the other hand, are holding people who are pending trial, and a large number, some of them for over 10 years. This is a situation we cannot encourage. This is a situation we continue to have conversations with as a broad justice sector. And part of the steps being taken are the decriminalization policies. Uh, you may have had uh, in the past uh, somebody saying that CJ has presented a bill to parliament uh, to try and do something with criminal laws. This is all part of decongesting the prisons, prisons, and it is a work of the National Council on Administration of Justice, which is a broad range of actors, and it all goes towards decongesting prisons. Um, on awareness <laughs> and prisons, uh, this is a, a, a broad question because it's not our preserve only as the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights to conduct awareness. We work with a lot of actors in conducting awareness of rights. And uh, I, I must say, as a commission, we have done a lot in going out there and advocating, promoting, and protecting rights. We have a lot of programs that are in place, both within the prisons. We actually go into the prisons and talk to the inmates. And actually, those who need help actually get help. Uh, those who don't need air help, also we are able to give them uh, other bodies or entities to assist them, especially in terms of legal aid to be able to take their cases to court for them. But the biggest challenge of those who are in prison is not because they are not aware of their rights, it's poverty. They have all been given bail and bond terms, but the bail and bond terms are such that these people cannot raise it. If you pick a poor boy on the street uh, because there's protests, and charge him with uh, causing uh, destruction of property, and then tell him to pay even a, uh, a bail, cash bail of 5,000, will he raise it? He will not. Will his mother take time to come and pay it for him? She will not. So our greatest challenge is poverty. It's not even the lack of awareness. And this is what we are trying to address in the raft of bills we are bringing. We are decriminalizing the small fi uh, cases. Like if you're caught, uh, talking on your phone, and you know, those small little things or whatever, you shouldn't be in jail. We should have a diversion policy so that you're addressed not as a criminal, not as a criminal. And that's what we are trying to ensure that most of the laws, our laws are very colonial. We need to find change into those laws so that we are able to reduce the kind of numbers of young people especially. Actually, the prisons are full of youth. And it's really, really sad. If you spend a day there, we spend a lot of time in prisons talking to them, and we see the misery that's on their faces. Some of them say, I don't even want my mother to know, because if she knew, she would sell her chicken and come here. But I don't want her to do that, because that's all she has. So it's, it's poverty. It's our main problem. It's not awareness. Our main problem is poverty. And we are trying to address that. Uh, evictions, Njiru, whatever is coming up, <laughs> Interesting. Do we wait for them to be evicted to react? No, we do not wait for them to be evicted. Um, luckily, the Njiro group has already uh, initiated court action, and uh, we are interested in seeing what that leads to. In most of the other cases, we actually try and engage before, 
but you will see that sometimes as we are engaging, uh, the tractors are brought in. In the middle of discussion, something happens at night and you, in the morning you wake up, the tractors are sitting there. So sometimes it is a case of timing. Uh, in the case of uh, Narok, we have already gone to court. We have got a stay order, and I think it is helping the community. They are very, very grateful that we have done that. And that's why we continue to engage, especially the Office of the Attorney General, in whose docket uh, most of these indigenous court judgments lie for implementation. And we are trying to ensure that implementation occurs and no further violations occur. We do not wait for harm. We try and protect and prevent uh, before. Thank you very much.